I want to quote a couple verses of scripture before we even start this morning. And they're not in Romans 3, so don't try to find them. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Do you know how high our God is? Do you know how grand our God is? Do you know how pure our God is? And notice that when I read those passages and recite those verses, that it says the whole earth is full of his glory. It does not say the whole earth encompasses all of God's glory. That's a very different statement. It's pictured as if you have a cup and you go up to Niagara Falls. How many of you have seen Niagara Falls? It's not too far from here. I saw it. The only time I ever saw it was in the dead of winter. Don't recommend it. Flying freezing water is not good. But if you see Niagara Falls, imagine to look at the world and say that that fully encompasses all of God's glory, or even all of the creation. To look at that and all of God's creation as if it fully encompasses God's glory, I'll liken to having a cup and trying to gather up all of Niagara Falls. The creation does not declare all of God's glory. The creation declares the glory of God. It points to him. The whole earth is full of it, just like that cup would be full of it under Niagara Falls. But if I brought back water from Niagara Falls and brought it back and set it here, and then I look at it and say, hey, that's Niagara Falls. How many of you would look at me and go, that's just a cup of water? Thank you, one of you would. Two. That's not Niagara Falls. That's just part of it. And when we talk about verses that declare the whole earth is full of God's glory, it speaks of a glory that's much grander and much higher and much greater than anything we could have ever seen. The whole earth is full of it because it is too big for the earth. The whole universe declares it because it could not possibly contain it. It simply speaks of it. The perfection of our Father in heaven is beyond our reckoning. But let me see if I can give you a glimpse. Habakkuk, and most, most of you know that my favorite Old Testament prophet is the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk in chapter 1 verse 13 shows us that the Lord is of purer eyes to even look upon evil. Of purer eyes to even look upon evil. Not the Lord can't do evil. That's pretty much understood. How many of you know that God does not sin? Good. We're going to get this interactive and hands are going to be raised today. Just one. We're in a Baptist church. Don't get carried away. The Lord cannot even look upon evil. Not the Lord doesn't do evil. That's other passages that say that quite clearly. The Lord cannot even look upon it. He is of purer eyes to even look upon it. And you see, we tend to lower God's holiness to a manageable level and say that it is somehow equivalent to God simply not sinning. Oh my, is it so much more than that? So much more than he just does not do wrong. God cannot even look upon evil. That would even tarnish him. To put it in our perspective, how many of you consider it a sin when you see somebody else lie? Is, does it tarnish you? Yeah, we just don't really perceive that. We don't really think of it in terms like that. We don't really think of sin in terms of its contagiousness. We don't think of sin in its terms of even looking upon it, not partaking of it, is in itself tarnishing to absolute pure holiness. This is how God is represented in the Word of God. Cannot look upon evil. Cannot even see it.
This goes beyond sins of commission and sins of omission. It is a holiness that would be tarnished by sin even being in its area. God is high above us. Unimaginable. The Bible never says and tries to declare exactly how pure the Lord is. It just always says He's purer even than that. It's always beyond what we can even describe in our own words. Most of you are looking at Romans 3 and saying, why are we talking about God's holiness? And it's because I want you to have a good foundation in it before we even crack open today's passage. Now that we have, let's go to Romans 3 and see what we're talking about. Romans chapter 3. This morning, I know it says on the screen 23 through 25, believe it or not, um, it, it's, it's part of 22 and only half of 25, uh, but we are going to be doing uh, from uh, verse 22, the very last phrase in it, to the middle of verse 25. I'm going to ask you to stand and honor God in His Word as we read that section. And where I stop reading is where we're going to stop for this morning. The end of verse 22, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You for these short phrases that describe to us the transaction of salvation. And Father, I pray that You open our eyes this morning Convict us with your spirit of sin and teach us with your spirit the things in your word. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. You can be seated. This morning I want to remind you of where we've been in Romans because it's actually been three weeks, believe it or not, since we've been in Romans. I know it's hard to understand. But we took a break for Easter and then last week I took a, uh, not so much a break as much as a, uh, uh, a detour for a second to go talk about Bartimaeus and Jericho last week. And now we find ourselves back in Romans, so I'm going to uh, help you get our setting once again. When we've talked about the book of Romans thus far, we've talked about um, actually probably one of the more complex sections of Scripture uh, from 118, Romans 118, all the way up to 320, which declared to us the fact that every person, regardless of their exposure to Revelation, regardless of how much they were exposed to Revelation, are held culpable to following the Lord's commands. It goes from even the person who has received simply general revelation in this world and does not respond to that rightly to then those who are simply described as, I would say, a moral unbeliever. This would describe, unfortunately, less and less of our society, but it would generally describe our society, at least for the past hundred years. The moralist, if you will, in following things that he knows to be right and wrong, even in his own mind that is unregenerate, knows the law of God. Because it's evident. It also says, well, what about the Jews? As I likened, what about people that actually have access to the Word of God? People that know the Word of God, that can recite it, that can teach it on Sunday mornings. Does this mean that they somehow have a relationship with God because they do this? And he says, no. No. They are just more culpable for the revelation they have. He says, well, what about the people, the Jews, or people who have the Word of God who just follow the works in it? I mean, they have the height of revelation. Shouldn't they be exempted from it? And he says, no. In simply keeping the works of the law and having it not change our hearts, there is absolutely no salvation found in that. In fact, they have even more culpability to following the gospel in its purest sense. And so what did we have at the end of all of that? If you look back a few verses, chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, I'll read that because that wraps up the whole section. Our horrific stance before a holy God. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, which it had previously determined to be everyone, so that every mouth may be stopped, and that the whole world may be held accountable to God. And this is the clincher. For by works of the law, 
No human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The first two and a half chapters of this entire book simply set up for us the fact that all of us know the law of God, and the law of God condemns all of us. And as I said, if the book of Romans ended at chapter 3, verse 20, it would be the worst message ever delivered to the human race. And three weeks ago, we did a sermon on verses 21 and part of 22, only about a verse and a half. And we started with that conjunction, but now. Because that's where the gospel enters the picture of the world. That's verse 21. That's where the gospel enters the world. If Christ never came, the book of Romans would end in chapter 3, verse 20. And that's why it says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. And although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through what? Keeping works of the law? What is verse 22? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all who believe, this is where we start this morning, for there is no distinction. This must be grasped before we move on in the study of Romans. There is no distinction. There is no, I'm better than this person. There is no, I'm better than anyone who's ever lived. There's no, I'm better than I used to be. I'm getting better. There is no distinction because the standard is high. The standard is out of reach. The standard is beyond anything that any man, regardless of exposure to the law of God, can fulfill. The law brings death. The law only brings about a knowledge of sin. But we have seen something else. And three weeks ago I did a sermon called Let There Be Light. Because just as God created the world and spoke into the darkness and said, let there be light. And he created from disarray, darkness and disorder, a creation that we just finished our study with the kids this morning that he dubbed as very good. An earth that was formless and void, darkness over the face of the deep, then the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Let there be light. The same pattern happens in the gospel, and we read of it here. There is no distinction, for all have sinned. Now, we're entering a verse, and I know most of us kind of shut off our brains when we come to a verse that we know. Uh, How many of you are familiar with 323 before we even got here this morning? I would say the vast majority of us would be able to quote, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yet that is only one section of a sentence. That leaves off the best part of that sentence, too. There is no distinction for all have sinned. That's not the best part, by the way. This, in reality, is referring back to verse 22, where it says, All who believe, all the world, all of everybody has sinned, even if you are a Christian. That doesn't do away with your sins. We'll talk about that in a little bit. How many of you as Christians still sin? Oh yeah. It does not wipe them away permanently. It doesn't mean that we are somehow perfect right now. It deals with them. It fulfills the requirement against us. It's very different. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. But there is no distinction And it refers back to that entire section that we've been talking about, verses 118 through 320. Doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum of revelation, whether it be a Stone Age tribe in the middle of nowhere, or whether it be a pastor who is preaching the Word of God every single morning. Without faith in the saving death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are all under sin. Now, most of us will look at that and go, yeah, I know that. I mean, that's really basic. I mean, that's, that's why I memorized this back when I was in, you know, first grade or something. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, that makes perfect sense to me. 
But I don't want you to miss something about that. When it says they fall short of the glory of God, you're actually going to find so many interpretations and commentaries about what exactly that means. And I'm going to try to help it out a little bit. Um, I came across about six different interpretations of what it means that mankind falls short of the glory of God. I'll give them to you right here. One commentator says, does it mean that we fall short of being able to give God glory? It's a possibility. Does it mean that we fall short of being likened unto the glory that is God's alone? Possibility. Does it mean that we lack the righteousness which God deems as glory? Some of these get a little involved. This is what I read to try to digest it to bring it here. Or does it mean that we lack the ability to glory in our own righteousness before God? If you're getting lost, don't worry, so was I. Does it mean that we have not the praise of God? Or does it mean that we have not the hope of future glory? My answer is yes. The reason it's very general is because we've fallen short on every facet of it. There is not one bit of that that could possibly be applicable to us. The answer is yes, 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 yes. It means we have no future glory. It means we cannot give glory to God. Our sin has gotten in the way so that we don't have a glory in and of ourselves. God cannot glorify himself in sinful man. It means every single one of them. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And I had someone give me a picture of this. They said, I don't know how many of you have heard this before. It's a picture of Grand Canyon. Well, the Grand Canyon. Or you can picture a Grand Canyon either way. And everyone lines up on the side and tries to jump across. And some people get closer than otherwise. How many of you have ever seen the Grand Canyon? Okay, how many of you have seen it in person, actually? Wow, that's quite a few. Way to go. I've never been out there. I always wanted to. How many of you have seen pictures of it and can imagine how big it is? Okay, it's huge. Everyone lines up on the side of it and tries to jump across. How many of you are going to actually make it? None of us. Okay. I think that that, although teaches one part of it, I think that kind of messes it up. What it is, is there is a cliff, and what you're aiming for is not just out of reach. It's not 20 times farther than you can jump. There is no other side you could possibly jump to, and you're told to jump. That's what trying to attain heaven on works is. You didn't make it farther than somebody else because you're never going to make it. That is not the way to please the Lord. That is not the way we are made righteous. We are not made righteous by works of the law. It implies as if somehow only our sin holds us back when in fact even our righteousness that is in ourself holds us back too. So in reality, everyone's just like lemmings falling off the side. It's not we're not good enough. It's even our good does not outweigh our bad because even our good is not good enough. This is why I start off this sermon this morning talking of the holiness of the Lord. Before Him, our righteousness is as what? What does the prophet say? It's filthy rags. There is nothing we can do to improve our standing. And yeah, this is resetting the entire concept that has been going on for two and a half chapters, but it's worth noting. We have fallen short. We have been tried and found wanting. In essence, we lack something that we need. We lack something. That which we are missing must be filled in. That infinite distance between us and the other side that you can't even do part of must be remedied. And this is where hearing of God's holiness this morning makes its application. We have an infinite gulf between us and the Lord. An infinite gulf. And that's why I say that Grand Canyon metaphor is insufficient. You couldn't even look at the other side. It is beyond anything we could possibly even come close to. But now we're going to hear the solution. 
Most of us, when we quote this verse, do not quote the next verse, and I think that's atrocious. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but what? And we are justified by His grace as a gift. Now, if you have other translations, you're going to see we are justified freely by His grace. Same concept. How many of you have ever paid for a gift? For yourself. That somebody else was giving you. Dante, I'm sorry. I'll give you a Christmas gift some year. When someone gives you a gift, do you have to pay for it? No. At least not in most circles. If someone gives you a gift, it's free, and it's freely given. And in fact, this is where we get set up to this. And I could spend the next month unpacking only this one phrase, that we are justified by His grace as a gift. Because there is so much in that phrase, and so much that is left unquoted when we quote 323, when we leave out 324. We are justified by His grace as a gift. And as much as I could spend the next month unpacking that one phrase, and alas, we're limited on time, so I want to just get some definitions out of the way. Justification. How many of you who feel confident enough to say this, define for me what does the word justification mean? And most of us read that and we pass right over it and go like, yeah, salvation or something. And I'm not asking for hands raised. I'm not asking for you to do that. I'm just saying, think in your own mind. Is this a word that you actually understand what's going on? Because most of us have heard a definition of it Close to just as if I'd never sinned. We play a word game with it. Justified is just as if I'd never sinned. And that's actually not sufficient. It's not a good description of what actually justification is. It sounds nice, but it's not reality. It cannot mean that God pretends you never sinned. Which is what that means. Just as if I'd never sinned. No, it's not. Do you remember your life before Christ? I do, and I was saved at 11. If you remember your life before Christ, do you think God remembers it? Yeah. Justification does not do with God saying, I'm going to ignore that that ever happened. That is not justification. Justification is not turning a blind eye to it. It cannot mean that God pretends you never sinned or that you still don't. God is too holy to look on sin and honestly far be it from him to lie about its existence. This is not what justification means. This is not God ignoring sin. It is God dealing with sin. That's justification. But it's not just dealing with sin and that's it. It's not just paying off the bad. It's actually replacing our sin with Christ's righteousness. And therefore we are justified. So if you want a really short definition of justification, it means to be made righteous. Not for God to turn a blind eye to your sin, not for God to just forget your sin and not accept any sacrifice. It's just forgotten. It's done away with. And this is unfortunately how a lot of people think of the gospel. This is not the gospel. There had to be a sacrifice. God could not just say, you know what, I'm just going to forget that you guys sinned. I'll just forgive you, just like we do. And when someone wrongs us, I mean, we don't demand a sacrifice, I hope not. I'm not going to ask who's done that. I'm just going to say, if someone wrongs us, do we actually forget it? No. Does that mean we can't forgive it? No, we still forgive it. But we're not holy. We're not of purer eyes to even look on sin. So yeah, we can still see it. But in God's eyes, when he looks at us, cannot look on sin And we must have a righteousness that is not our own, as Paul says in Philippians 3. A righteousness that is not our own. A righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That is justification. It is a trading out of everything that is us and a replacing of it with everything that is Christ. It is not removing our bad and just filling in the holes. It's removing everything and filling it in with Christ's righteousness. We do not just need our sins forgiven. 
we need to be righteous and perfect and holy. Not just innocent. We need to be perfect. This is what Christ does for us. Okay, before we even get into this, how about grace? Another word we toss around a lot. Grace, the simple definition, is God's unmerited favor. I'm going to go a little deeper than that. It is God's unmerited, undeserved, unrequested, undesired, and undemanded favor. In order for grace to be grace, and this is truly key to understanding grace, in order for grace to be graced, it must be given. It cannot be requested. It is not responding to man's request. It is God initiating. It has to be. It cannot be earned. It cannot be demanded. And here's the crux of it. Grace, in order for it to actually be grace, has to be offered freely. If there was something we could do to purchase it, some promise we could make by saying, God, I want to live for you, and everything I'm going to do from here on out is going to be a lot better than I did before. First of all, if you're saying that to God, just don't say that. How many of you have ever tried to... Now, don't raise your hands. How many of you have ever come to the Lord, repented of a sin, and said, I'll never, ever do that again? That, that's another sin. You just lied to God because you're gonna. God is the one who perfects us. Grace is where it starts. Grace is God initiating that relationship with us, and it must be offered freely from the one giving it. Because if it is requested or if it is demanded, that is God being compelled to give it. That's not grace. And that's not a gift. I think most of us have had family members that if we didn't send them a gift, they probably snubbed us a bit. If we forgot their birthday or their anniversary or Christmas or something like this, there gets this indignancy of, you didn't give me something, as if that's required. Okay, gifts are not required, if, if I can help you with that a little bit. Gifts can't be required. Because what do you get if you're coming to a birthday party and the person includes on the invitation, they say, by the way, um, spend at least $25 on my gift. Is that a gift anymore? No. What I'm going to give them will be a gift because it's going to be free. But it's certainly not going to take $25 because if I give them something that's $25, I'm now just compelled to do that. That's not a gift anymore. That's a requirement. That's an expectation being fulfilled. That's not grace. Grace in order to be grace must be free. And we cannot compel God to give it to us. We have then, in this phrase, the righteousness of God the righteousness of Christ applied to our account. It makes us righteous. And this is given to us from God, and it is unmerited, undeserved, and unrequested by us. This is the center part of the gospel. This is God initiating salvation in a person who has just been described for the past two and a half chapters as being so bent away from God that not a single person that has ever lived outside of God's grace has ever, ever sought after God. If you don't remember that, that's the start of chapter 3. Not a single person ever. That's actually verse 10. You can look at it right there. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. And this is describing apart from God's grace. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And just in case you're not clear on that, it says not a single one, not one, or something of that type, seven different times all in a row, to make it clear. Apart from God's grace, not a single person would have ever been saved. And all of us, apart from God's grace, will never, ever find salvation. It is not in keeping the works of the law. It is not in being a moral people. It is not in coming to church. It is not in reading the Word of God. 
We find salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else. I don't know about you, but that's incredible to me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. How does it come to us? It comes to us through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There is no other way. This does not allow wiggle room. This is not one of those passages where we can say, I wonder how we could interpret that. This is the one highway in which it comes to us. It is through the redemption in Jesus Christ. There is absolutely no other place that we find God's grace. It is the initiate of it. It is the reason, as it's going to get into in the next several verses, the very reason that God withheld by his mercy his judging of the world until the fullness of time came and he could send Christ. It all pointed to that. In fact, people in the ancient world actually re realize this. That's why our calendar is based on when Christ came. Now, we in our modern societies have forgotten utterly about this. At least my generation has. There is no other way that God's grace comes to this world other than Christ. And redemption here, as it says, carries with it a sense of purchase. Outside of the Bible, can you think of where you see the term redemption or redeem? How many of you clip coupons? Oh, okay, one in the back, great. There was a, there was a TV show about like crazy couponing, people that could get like hundreds of dollars worth of orders with like eight dollars or something like this because they got incredible amounts of coupons. Anyway, I watched it a while ago and it reminded me of this because on every coupon you'll see redeem by or redemption made at or something like this. That is the exact same term as this. Same definition. It's as good as cash. How many of you know if you have a dollar coupon or so, let's say a dollar off coupon on a $5 purchase, how much does that purchase set you back? It sets you back $4 and one coupon. Because as far as that purchase is concerned, that's as good as cash. This is the exact same terminology here. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God cannot simply come into this situation as if coming to the store and lifting you off the shelf and just walking out with you because he decides to. He must redeem us. And no, I'm not saying that there's Christian coupons or something. I'm just saying God cannot just take us out of this. There is a price that has to be paid. God cannot simply turn a blind eye to sin. God cannot simply look upon sin and then ignore it. It must be paid for. And basically you, because of your predicament, cannot and I just spent the last three chapters setting this up, you cannot initiate that payment. You can't do enough works of the law to initiate that payment. You can't read enough of the Word of God, study it, teach it, follow it, do anything you want. It's not enough. It'd be like trying to buy a motorcycle with a one-cent coupon. It's not enough. It's never going to be enough. You cannot request it. You have no voice outside of God's grace. And all I say to that is thanks be to God for initiating it. Thanks be to God who gave us a grace freely as a gift that is not ours, but has been made ours in Christ. He must be the one to redeem us. And it must cost him something. Payment has to be made. This is the reality of grace. This is the reality of redemption. And it's the reality of love. The one loving always has a cost. How many of you ever have loved somebody and it didn't cost you any time or energy or uh, effort? I've never loved somebody where it took me no time, 
no effort, no encouragement, no nothing. That's not what love is. Love costs something. And oftentimes it loses. Think of the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But is the reality that the entire world is actually going to come to salvation? No. There are going to be many people who don't. Love loses sometimes. In fact, quite often. And payment has to be made for us. And that's what this next section is all about. Verse 25. We're not going to get too far into verse 25. End of verse 24 into it. Through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. That payment was fulfilled. That's what propitiation means. Take that word... I I hate saying this, but nobody ever remembers the definition of propitiation. So let me put it this way. If you want to remember it, write a different word there. It means satisfaction. That's not a word we use anymore. Uh, How many of you run into that word in our culture anymore? We don't use that word anymore. It really doesn't help us. That payment was fulfilled by the blood of Christ. Redemption had to be made. We had to be purchased. Why? We were slaves of sin. This is the exact same metaphor as a slave who is owned by a different master and has to be purchased from underneath that master to be brought into the house of its new master. We were purchased from the house of sin and placed in the house of God, and it cost God his son to do it. But that payment had to be made. And it was satisfied. It was made satisfied by the blood of Christ. This is whom God put forward as a satisfaction by His blood. And if this passage stopped there, it would be a little bizarre. I'm not going to lie to you. If that passage, that sentence, or that thought stopped right there, it would be a little strange, and it actually wouldn't even fit with Paul's entire overarching argument. What's the verse that is the theme of this entire section? The righteous shall live by faith. He hasn't even mentioned faith yet, though. And if it stopped there, it would seemingly imply that this is on the account of every person in the world. What would preclude it? As it says, all have sinned. And then it says, and are justified by His grace as a gift. It's a universal rule. Everyone has sinned, and all who sinned to be justified, are justified by God's grace as a gift. But see, what's the other half of giving a gift? It must be received. If you go to a birthday party and bring a gift because of your love for someone, it costs you whatever, they didn't request it, and you put the gift on the counter and it's all nice and wrapped up with a bow and a card and all this stuff, and they refuse to open it. Was the gift actually given then? The gift was given, it just wasn't received. See, this passage refers to us as how it is received as well. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. We are certainly saved by grace because outside of grace there is absolutely nothing we could do. There's no faith, there's no grace, there's no hope outside of God's grace. And that's why it finishes off, and we're going to stop right here at verse 25, whom God put forward as a satisfaction by His blood to be received by faith. This must come to us through faith. And that is how this section ties into the rest of this theme, the righteous shall live by faith. This is how the righteous start. And when it says the righteous, it actually means the righteous ones, the ones who are righteous. They are righteous because they live by faith. This is where faith starts. It starts by God's grace coming into their life. They repent and believe in the gospel, and that faith causes them to grow. The Spirit of God indwells them and starts producing in them the fruit of the Spirit. 
And they start growing and growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And yes, I know, sin is still with us. We'll deal with that in chapter 7. But as far as our account is concerned, we are sons of the Holy God. Adopted by the living God who is ever our Father, and when He looks at us, He does not see, wow, they were, they were pretty good this week. They were better than last week. So I am pleased with them. No, He looks at us and sees the righteousness of Christ on our account. All I can say is if we had a God who was displeased with His children simply because they had a sin come up in their life, you're not understanding the Gospel. Because the Gospel takes everything that is us and replaces it with Christ. Does this mean that we can have lethargy when it comes to sin? Absolutely not. We have the Spirit of the living God within us. There is no way we can continually live in sin and have it go completely untested. And all of you who are Christians absolutely know what I'm talking about. I had a pastor say once that he was told that if he preached that, then that means you're just giving people license to sin. And he says, great, I tell you what, if you're a Christian, go try it and see how far you get. You're not going to get far. You know why? Because you were purchased from your previous master, sin. You now have a new, not just father, a new master. And you do his will. Now, does this mean that everything you do is perfect? No. Does this mean that sin is okay? No. In fact, 2 Peter 2 gives one of the worst warnings to any teacher to actually say, sin's okay, just do whatever you want and presume on the grace of God. Describes that as the worst type of false teacher. That's not what this says. What this says is you have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. You have been given a gift. This is why I entitled the sermon God's Great Gift. You have been given a gift and it is redemption by the grace of God. Because in our state, outside of God's grace, we wouldn't have even known to ask for it. God's grace initiated salvation. And no, everybody does not have that applied to their account as some popular authors are trying to write these days. It must be received by faith. Now we look at this, most of us here are Christians. Most of us when we look at this, we say, why study this as Christians? We know the gospel. Why walk through the first half of Romans? We, we know that stuff. You know, we did the Romans road. We understood it. it. It makes sense to us. I know we had to be purchased, and that's why Christ came to die in every other Sunday school answer. We know we didn't earn salvation. We know it began and it continues by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and the substitutionary death of Christ alone. Absolutely. So why study this as Christians? Got one answer for you. To be thankful. Christians quickly forget. We all quickly forget. We get used to salvation. And we'll usually look at salvation and go, yeah, yeah, thanks God, we'll sing it, you know. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a life so free. But I tell you what, there are very few places in the Word of God where we are told specifically and demonstrably this is the will of God for you and saying thanks is one of the three that there is. Because if we lose our sense of gratefulness to our Father, we're going to start walking backwards we're not going to realize the fact that salvation did not start with us. And if God was not gracious and not loving, we would not be in this relationship with him. 
God did not respond to our begging and pleading. God, by his grace, entered the realm of man and woke us up from death and gave to us a new life. And for that, we must be grateful. And we must not ever lose sight of that gratefulness. In fact, it's even described as prayer. How many of you around your dinner table and you say, well, who wants to say the prayer? What are like two other ways to say that? Who wants to say grace? And who wants to say thanks? There's a reason why through the years and years of the church that that has been passed down to us. It's because that is our primary interaction with our Father. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice always. Say thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why we study this as Christians. It's so we don't forget that salvation started with God, and apart from His intermission, we would still be bumping around the darkness. And that passage I just quoted in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 actually doesn't just say, say thanks, for this is the will of God. It says, in everything, say thanks. Because your whole life, your whole being, your whole existence is wrapped up in the grace of God. Be ye thankful. And no, I'm not going to say application and wrap up and go home. We're going to take five minutes of silence now and we're going to give thanks.